Hello, everyone. Um, and welcome to my presentation. Um, I just want to start off by thanking the organizers of Change the Game for inviting me to come and speak to you in this session. I only wish I could be there in person rather than do this by Zoom, but um, this is the new normal that we've all had to get used to in the past, uh, past few months since the pandemic has uh, uh, taken hold of everyone. Uh, look, I, I'm really happy to be able to share some ideas with you uh, in this session. Around physical literacy as a health promotion tool, I have here for brain health, but actually, um, I have a actually bigger agenda in mind here. I think it should be really health broadly defined, although I do think mental cognitive health is a really particularly important outcome, and I will show you some research that speaks specifically to, the, to, to that particular domain, um, but particularly in relation to uh, post-COVID-19 recovery. Um, mental well-being, mental health are going to be top priority for um, governments, for educators, and certainly for research scientists. And I think physical literacy has a really important role to play in health promotion generally and in health promotion around brain health specifically. So um, I just really want to start out by talking about a, a model of um, uh, physical literacy, physical, physical activity and health that my colleagues and I created, published uh, a couple of years ago now uh, in sports medicine. There really was an attempt to outline a, a model that uh, allowed us to um, begin to theorize the potential connections that existed between physical literacy, um, physical activity, and a variety of different health-related outcomes. The model looks, uh, looks like this, uh, which um, again is uh, I often joke and say it uh, probably looks a lot more complicated than it actually is. So I'm going to just walk you through um, some of the highlight features of it. Um, basically, if we start over in the uh, what is my furthest left uh, on, on my screen, probably right to your eyes, is really the concept of physical literacy itself. And, and really here what I've done is oversimplified uh, the connections between the various domains that have been identified as core domains of physical literacy. So the competence, confidence, knowledge, uh, the aspects around social participation and the positive effective states that are associated with physical literacy and movement more generally. And, and depicted it as a, as a kind of feedback loop where you know, we, we hope that through learning a, a new movement competence, wherever that might be, whether it's in land, air, water, uh, other, other kinds of physical contexts, when that competence is acquired, it, it, it instills a sense of confidence and competence in an individual that increases this positive engagement of participation. And, and when that's done right, when, when those conditions uh, arise in a positive way, then there's some positive affective states that come from that. Feelings of joy, feelings of happiness, feelings of enjoyment and fun uh, are often the kind of positive affective states that are associated with the experience of that positive engagement loop. And we actually believe that, 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 that that's part of what's meant when theorists like Margaret Whitehead talk about knowledge, that it's really that experiential knowledge that derives from that positive cycle of engagement that gives people a sense of where they are in, in, in themselves, with themselves, where, where their bodies are in space, who they are and see movement as an inherent um, part of, of, of the human experience and the knowledge that, that comes from that as reinforcing um, that, that positive spiral of engagement. So that's, an, again, an oversimplification, but, but really what's emphasized there is that physical literacy, as we all know, is a multidimensional construct. It's not just about movement, but it's about that experiential convergence of movement, affect, social participation, and, and, and those, element, those fundamental uh, motivational elements that, that, that all occur to create this positive cycle of engagement. I believe Professor Creelars has given a talk prior to this about his uh, emerging model of the positive spiral that I've been working with him on, um, which he does a much better job of articulating those things. So if we just hold that in our heads for a moment as kind of what this ultimately should have looked like, um, that's, that's a better model. But I think we get the general point. I hope you get the general point around physical literacy. What comes next in the model is really um, what we already know quite well. Actually, really the rest of the model on is, is stuff we already know. And, and, and when I say we already know, what I mean is we have a strong evidence base to support the links between physical activity and the positive physiological and psychological and social 
adaptations that occur as a result of that physical activity, which then confers a whole variety of positive health um, outcomes. So really the rest of the model, at least in the core part of it, the, these boxes here, is really emphasizing what we already know around the links between physical activity and positive health outcomes, physical, mental, social, a whole, diff a whole array really of different, um, physical, uh, uh, different health outcomes. And, and again, very well established in the literature. What's novel about the model is that it makes this explicit link between physical literacy and the connections to physical activity. In other words, in this model, physical literacy is a fundamental determinant of physical activity, which in turn gives rise to a whole set of, of positive health uh, outcomes through those physiological and psychological adaptations that, that occur in the body and through interaction with others that arise from physical activity. So um, it's, a, it's, it's just a way of, of de depicting what is otherwise a pretty sim simple linear relationship. The more physically literate a person is, the more that they have experienced those green lights that P P Professor Creelars talked about, that positive engagement cycle, the more likely they are to engage in autonomous participation, independent autonomous participation. And, and what I mean by independent is, is, is that they want to do it on their own, that, they, that that's autonomous, they, they want to be involved in physical activity. And then once they're in, involved in physical activity, a whole array of positive things occur. Um, the other parts of the model which make it somewhat more complex are these um, um, spheres at the, at the top and bottom of the model that indicate environmental and individual level factors, things that influence those simple linear pathways between physical literacy, physical activity, and, and health-related outcomes. And if I maybe focus on these two just to illustrate the point, the arrows that are actually connecting to the linear um, model area arrows suggest that these are things that can influence or in the language of statistics, moderate the association between physical literacy and physical activity. So if we take environmental context as an example, we can imagine a circumstance where, where individual has acquired um, a, a set of physical competencies and experience this positive feedback loop that we've been describing, um, but that it doesn't necessarily immediately translate into physical activity because the context, the environmental context in which they find themselves might be uh, not, in, not conducive to promoting the the linkage between the attainment of those skills and, and physical activity itself. Um, so for example, um, I, used, I like to use the example with children because uh, I think it's particularly poignant. Um, children in many ways are hardwired to move. Uh, they, they, they naturally gravitate towards movement. Um, what we seem to do a very effective job on in, in the West in particular is suppressing their, their movement. So we put them in highly structured environments we ploy them with technologies that encourage them to be sedentary. So we, we present a whole set of environmental um, contexts and cues that actually try to work against that natural desire to want to be active, to want to move. And so that would be an example of where even when the development of physical competencies is occurring in a positive way in, 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 in the physical literacy cycle, and it should lead to physical activity, it's actually thwarted by policies, by practices, by cultural factors that actually deter movement. And so that's what those arrows um, hitting those other big blocked arrows is actually suggesting. On an individual level, we could think about things like personality or, or um, uh, certain dispositions or characteristics an individual might have that might um, be more conducive or less conducive to that translation of physical literacy to physical activity. And we've got them there in, in relation to those physical activity and health outcomes, and it works essentially the same way. The last part of the model that I would highlight is this kind of broad developmental arc that sits over top of this that identifies developmental stages from early childhood through to old age. And basically what this arrow is intended to represent is that we don't think about this uh, model connecting physical literacy to health outcomes through physical activity as being all about one part of the life course or more or less important at some parts of the life course than others. And in fact, it should be something that's thought of as developmentally arcing across one's own entire lifespan 
um, and, and that, that there are many, many opportunities for the engagement of this physical literacy, physical activity cycle um, at different points in the life course. Even though we may, and I'm certainly guilty of it, in research overemphasize the early child to emerging adulthood period as being particularly critical. Um, we can think of all kinds of circumstances where there are new and important physical literacy demands that can emerge in adulthood and even into old age that, that we need to be thinking about the promotion of and, and thinking about how we do uh, better in that space. So in a nutshell, that's our, our um, developmental model that was published in, in sports medicine. I wanna talk now a little bit about what's happened since we published that article back in, in 2019. So this is one example of a way in which you can track the impact of research. And it's based upon how many people have not only read the article, but chosen to cite it in their own research or in their own conceptual papers. And you, you can see here that um, there's been a quite a steep rise since the article came out rather late in 2019. Um, through to the most recent data that we have in 2021, showing that overall the article has been cited uh, over 140 times and it seems to be on the rise. And, and particularly when we look at 20, 2020 and 2021, um, that that's where the bulk of those citations have occurred. Now, this to me suggests a couple of things. Um, number one, uh, there's something of resonance to that model that makes sense to people. And I think it was really one of the first articles, if not one of the only articles that really tried to explicitly make those links between physical literacy, physical activity and health outcomes, which is probably why it's been been cited, but also that people um, have been quick to adopt it. So, you know, so it came out sort of late 2019, or in the, at least the second half of 2019, um, for, for somebody to have read it and incorporated it into their own research, you know, there's a developmental lag between when we read something and when we operationalize it in our own work, but people seem to have picked it up quite quickly. And I think that actually speaks um, not so much to the article, but to the broad interest that our field has in thinking about physical literacy as a health promotion tool or as a determinant of health and well-being. So um, overall, it's been quite widely cited and quite adopted um, rather rapidly. So on the basis of that, what can we say, you know, two, two plus years into the post period of its publication or about two years post period of it, of its publication, where are we, what, have, what, ha, what do we know based upon these 144 citations, and I think there's really three things that I want to emphasize in the final moments of this presentation. One is that we are still rich on ideas, light on evidence. So uh, a lot of those 144 publications were, were similarly theoretical or conceptual papers, either directly engaging with the model as, as a potential tool step forward for understanding or, or critiquing it and actually saying, oh, you know, maybe, maybe they've missed some of those, Kearney and those researchers have missed something important or, or maybe this is a direction that we shouldn't be going in. So it, it seems to have been good at stimulating more thinking um, but it hasn't necessarily yet translated into um, empirical evidence about those linkages. So I can say with great confidence, for example, no one has yet tested the pathways in those models that I described in a comprehensive way. People have taken pieces of the model and tested it, but a comprehensive test of the model has yet to come. In terms of outcomes, I think what's interesting is I, I, I purposely in the paper, my colleagues and I rather purposely didn't get down to specific kinds of health outcomes. So we didn't focus, for example, on, on a particular cancer or cardiovascular disease. We tried to stay very broad with physical and health related um, outcomes. And, and there are other outcomes that are potentially subsumed within that health um, framework or that health definition that haven't yet been explored or only in very rudimentary ways. And then the final statement I would make and kind of relates to the previous two is, you know, where is the bulk of research going? What, what kinds of evidence do we need? And I think, you know, we really need both um, interventional evidence. We need evidence that if we design a physical literacy program, you know, do we get improvements in physical literacy that lead to increases in physical activity, which in turn confer health benefits? And we seem to do a good job at the first part of that equation, but not the last part. And I also think, though, we need observational research, which shows in free living conditions 
that when those physical literacy elements are present at an individual level, that physical activity be behaviors are commensurate with that and that health outcomes, positive health outcomes also are correlated with those outcomes. And we don't have that as yet. Um, so this is an example of, of you know, some evidence to support the claims I've just made. Uh, interesting paper by uh, Katie Cornish and her colleagues, which is, which is really a scoping review of what do we know about the relationship between physical literacy and, 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 and health-related outcomes. And essentially, they come to the, the conclusions that I just mentioned. Um, we're, we're big on theory, light on evidence, and there's really, really important gaps that need to be addressed. Now, I don't know uh, Katie personally. I've heard of, I'm familiar with some of her team colleagues, but usually when somebody does a scoping review, it's a prelude to, um, I'm going to do some work in this area, so I'm going to figure out first what needs to be done, where the gaps are, and then I'm going to do some work. So I'm hoping that, that, that Katie and her colleagues are working right now on, uh, on a project that will address some, some of these limitations. But if you want a good read, a little bit deeper read in terms of what we know and what we don't, I would highly recommend this paper. In terms of the outcome pieces, here's a, a, a nice paper by um, Dean, uh, who, who spoke earlier, and, and a colleague of ours, Phil Jeffries, uh, along with Michael Unger and Patrice Orbitan, um, looking at physical literacy as a determinant of resilience, particularly in children and youth. And, and you can see also by the metrics here, now these are not citations, but, but basically it, 9,000 people approximately have downloaded this article and they've read it. So, so they're clearly interested in, the, in this topic. Resilience is obviously a hot topic, but I think resilience is an example of one of those outcomes that I, that I made reference to a moment ago. We don't typically think of resilience as a health outcome, but if it is true as this article suggests, and they present empirical evidence to support the claim, if it's true that physical literacy builds resilience, we certainly know that resilience is itself an important determinant of a variety of different health, mental and physical health outcomes. So being resilient, for example, is an is a extremely important component in managing stressful experiences in life and managing stressful circumstances. Stress, we know, when it's unchecked and toxic, can relate uh, can translate into a variety of different, be a risk factor for a variety of different mental and physical health concerns. Resilience is a protective factor that protects people from those negative toxic effects of stress, as one example. So this, I think this paper and others like it that are starting to emerge are broadening our conceptualization and definition of health. So I'd love to see some more research coming that shows links between physical literacy and not only traditional or standard kinds of health outcomes, but important mediating factors like or moderating factors like resilience that influence a variety of different behaviors and health outcomes itself. So I think this is a, a really interesting direction that deserves more work. And I'll leave you finally with, with uh, an example of what I was alluding to before in terms of um, more work in intervention and, and, and certainly more in observational work, but for the for the in the interest of time i'll focus on intervention first so here's a, an example of an article that i co-wrote again with dean and and some of those same colleagues uh include and also dean dudley from macquarie university and here what we did was look at the effect of a circus arts based, based curriculum on the development of physical literacy in children who were in years four and five in the canadian system and basically what it showed was that that was that that sort of curriculum that program design is a very effective way of developing physical literacy in children in particular it's a good way of, of minimizing or in some sense mitigating the differences between boys and girls that we typically see particularly in movement competencies by providing them with a an alternative approach to the acquisition of, of, of new and important skills that derive, that they can then derive that sense of competence and confidence, that positive engagement cycle. Um, where we probably stop short in this intervention and where a lot of interventions do is taking it to the next step and looking at, um, does this Im do these improvements rather in physical literacy through these interventions lead to short and longer term changes in physical activity behavior. And if we follow the children, the cohort it doesn't have to be children, we follow the participants long enough, do those long term changes in physical activity behavior result in improvements in health and well being. We would hypothesize that they do, but we actually don't have um, particularly strong ev evidence at this time 
to actually definitively make that conclusion. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just um, once again, thank the organizers for inviting uh, me to speak and, and thank you for tuning in and listening. I hope there was something of value in that. Uh, I think the really exciting thing is that physical literacy and health is really a, an emergent field. So for those of you who are interested in research and students in particular, there's some really fundamental basic research that still needs to be done. So it's an exciting time to um, take that passion that you have for this particular area and trans translate it into um, valuable research that the community will uh, benefit from, we'll all benefit from. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>